Hello and welcome to Exploring Global Problems, a podcast where we talk to academics from Swansea University whose groundbreaking research is tackling global challenges, from health innovation to sustainable futures and the environment, from digital technologies to clean energy. My name is Sam Blacksland and today I'm joined by Dr Natalie Brown, Research Officer for the Welsh Institute of Performance Science here at Swansea. Natalie's research focuses on the menstrual cycle and its effect on participants in physical activity, athlete development and sport performance. Natalie, welcome to Exploring Global Problems. Thanks so much for having me. Before we talk about this uh, in detail, can you just give us an overview of what your research is about? Yeah, so I research into the menstrual cycle, but that's anything from how it might impact um, girls at school um, taking part in physical activity, um, up to elite performance and anything in between that really is to influence that might have on exercise, performance, sport. Um, that's kind of my my overview of what I'm doing. Great. Now, I'm not an expert in um, in lots of things we do on this uh, on this show, actually. I, I think it's fair to say I'm not an expert on this topic as well. So if we just take it for a second back to the real the real fundamentals here. In terms of the menstrual cycle and, and women having periods, et cetera, how, how does it affect the individual and how can that then sort of have a knock on on, on what you research? So first of all, I think one of the things that does make the research quite difficult, but also great to acknowledge is everyone has a completely unique and individual experience of the menstrual cycle in their period. So what, what it's like for one person can be different for another. But the I suppose it all relates to the changes in hormones and fluctuating hormones across the menstrual cycle. And those changes in hormones can cause different symptoms, different experiences, which can then impact on anything from, as I've said, I focus on physical activity, but that might also affect mood. It might affect emotions like attendance at work. There are so many different aspects um, that just day to day can interact with. Great. I know um, probably half of our listeners will will understand that question that I've asked, but from coming from a, from a male like this, sometimes it's just useful to get some of the, 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 the grounding. But it, you work directly with, with people here, you work with athletes in particular. So on a practical level, tell us about this. How, how do you do it? So when I'm working with more uh, kind of elite athletes, when we're thinking about performance and really kind of optimising performance within a sporting setting, First of all, it's around understanding what that individual's experience is. So what symptoms are associated at what time across the menstrual cycle? See, the menstrual cycle can be a normal cycle is anything from 21 to 35 days. And again, that changes from individual to individual. So working out what that length is um, and then starting to look at, okay, what factors does that individual experience, that athlete experience, and therefore actually how can we then mitigate, manage, reduce any negative impacts on performance but the flip side of that for me is also actually how do we maximize the positive aspects so there's times throughout the menstrual cycle um estrogen for example when that's high can actually make individual athletes feel more confident more energetic um more motivated so actually how do we also really harness that and use that in their advantage as well interesting so yeah, that that talking about the positives, uh, I suppose that's not what a lot of people associate when we talk about this. You know, you said symptoms. I, I think a lot of people's default will be to pain, um, lethargy. I, I, I don't know. What, what what might we be thinking about? Yeah, so ne- definitely, and I suppose that's one, one reason I brought that up, is we straight away associate the menstrual cycle with it being negative. It's inconvenience, like the actual bleeding, and then symptoms are tend to be negative so things like stomach cramps as you mentioned maybe feeling tired having mood swings just generally that it's a bit harder to do things it just feels more of an effort um and so there are a lot of the negative symptoms that can you know stomach cramps is one of the most common and um, so for example if you're about to race at the olympic games yeah. and you've got really severe stomach cramps <laughs> yeah. actually that's probably going to have an impact on your performance so what plans can we put in place to prevent that from happening it is a big deal isn't it i'm 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 for my sins of a, a, a runner and i've got lots of friends who, who who are women and they have to think about this the, the, these sort of things quite particularly because there is there are certain times where it is going to be potentially a lot harder to do physical activity which just isn't the case for someone someone like me yeah most definitely and that's the case for symptoms but also just the aspect of bleeding mm. like you know having that thought process of worrying about leaking or you know that's just for so many, and again, this isn't just athletes now, this is across the whole pathway in sport and physical activity, a real hindrance almost for taking part is just that distraction or that worry that actually that they're leaking and how do you manage that? So that in itself, I'd kind of describe as a symptom in 
impact that has. Tell us about your plans for role models. Oh, that's a good question. I think um, it actually really varies in terms of role models because, for example, there's elite athletes that have openly sp- spoken about their experiences um, and said that, you know, they've had to pull out of a competition. We've seen that a lot recently in British athletics or kind of requesting more support. But equally, um, trying to almost even have like role models within schools um, where actually girls are actively helping others or supporting peers and talking like that's one big thing for me is actually it's quite a taboo subject still there's definitely been a shift since I started my research but it is still a subject that maybe not everyone would be comfortable talking around so even having role models within like those situations of girls that go actually I'm or you know girls and boys actually I'm happy talking about it and kind of lead in those conversations can have a massive impact so it's about sort of talking to you, interacting with people kind of across the, the spectrum. It's not just the elites like we might think of if we're talking about this this subject. It's people, yeah, across the board. I think so because, you know, eventually, hopefully, it'd be great to have like a shift within that perception in society that actually the menstrual cycle is normal. It's a biological process and it's okay to talk about. And I think sport has a great place to try and change that through like some of the elite level role models that if they're talking openly again it inspires others but equally just day to day within our normal environments that also having people talking then can also really create that change in perception and behavior sure Uh, you work with coaches as well don't you so not just necessarily the people directly affected tell us tell us about that coaches have been really interesting um because in a lot of situations well, there's been multiple different scenarios. Some coaches have been so open and they're like, well, yes, if it affects performance, then of course I'm going to talk about it. But then in other situations, I've had coaches that are just like, I don't even know how I'd bring that up in conversation. And again, that's whether that's it, grassroots level or even Olympic level athletes. When I've spoken to, you know, part of supporting them, of speaking to the athlete and the coach, both of them have been like, I have never, ever had that conversation. Coaches are worried. Um, and actually, this is both male and female coaches, you know, worried about bringing up the conversation or um, it being awkward or saying the wrong thing. It's all been those sorts of conversations I've had. And a big part of working with coaches might not actually be around what is the menstrual cycle, but actually, how do we have a conversation about that? You might not have the answer to this. This might be a bit of a, a left field question, but is is this a particularly British problem? Do you think as well in that we're a little bit reticent to talk about you know private things? I mean, is there any evidence? Or have you done any work on on sort of the international context and whether this is more discussed in in other countries and other scenarios? It's really interesting because I wondered that, mm. um, but actually I've been doing some work over um, in Sweden, mm-hmm. and that's exactly the same okay. situation. In a famously kind of supposedly open society. Yeah, liberal, yeah. Um, okay. America again. Mm-hmm. Same same situation, Australia, similar situation again. So I think across all, there's definitely pockets where people are comfortable compared to not comfortable, but it does seem to be very inconsistent from my experience and my research um, globally. Well, I was going to ask as well about the when you were talking about these conversations between coaches and athletes sometimes being awkward, I, immediately I was thinking, is this because the coaches are often male and obviously the athletes you're working with are, are, are female, but but not not quite like that? It does. It is more, yes, there is a much higher proportion of yeah. male coaches. So yeah. naturally, just the amount of male coaches there are, we see more awkward conversations in that situation. But again, that's because there's probably quite a few female coaches relative to that. Um, But as you say, in that one piece of research I did was actually with female coaches around how do they support their female athletes. And that was really varied. Some used their own experiences um, of menstruation, of how they supported, um, both in positive and negative ways. So as I said at the start, everyone's individual. So if someone had never struggled, it was like, well, why is this affecting you? Whereas others had had a really negative experience was in some ways sometimes over the top of like we need to consider every little detail of it rather than kind of really adjusting for for that individual approach. And in terms of the methodology here you know you say you talk to people does your research just involve quite a lot of going out and speaking to people even interviewing them recording them is that is that how you get a lot of this data? Was it At the moment yeah, yeah that's kind of um so I started my research 
I work at, um, based at Sport Wales. I was working with a group of um, kind of athletes there and we kind of felt we wanted to experience and understand a bit more around females in sport um, and individuals who menstruate in sport. And um, to start off with, I was just like, actually, if it doesn't affect them, then actually, do we need to provide any more support or any more research in this area? But we didn't really know that there just wasn't that information out there. So started off just having conversations with the athletes, just saying like, you know, when you're training, does your menstrual cycle affect you? When you're at competition, do you like, how do you manage that? You know, do you speak to a coach? Just asking all of those kind of questions really to start off with. And at the time I was like, if they all come back saying, no, it doesn't affect me at all. Then I was like, then we move on to the next stage. Um, and almost five years later, I feel like I'm even further behind where I was then. Um, because, you know, hopefully as we're talking about now, it does definitely affect um, elite athletes, but also affects, you know, individuals at school t- taking part in PE and just generally being physically active. Um, so yeah, definitely just having those conversations has been so insightful though. I think it's the sign of good research sometimes if when you get into it, you realise there's so much more to do and there's more that you can do. Oh yeah, definitely. I feel like, uh, as I said, I'm maybe further back now than when I when I first started, but with some good progress yeah. along the way. One thing you did there was... Um, sort of indirectly brought up the issue of terminology as well, because we could talk, as I've just done as well, about, about women, which sort of feels quite quite natural and the, the default thing for me to do. But also, when I was reading up on this and trying to do some research, you know, you do come across this term, people who menstruate uh, as well. So, yeah, I mean, this, th- th- there obviously are some, whether difficulty is the right word or some sort of uh, w- some subtleties here that we need to kind of grapple with, isn't there? Yeah, definitely. To acknowledge that not everyone who menstruates might identify as female. Um, So that's sometimes why we do use the terms individuals who menstruate. But as you said, it does feel also quite natural that we're talking about women and girls. But I think it is always great to acknowledge that, as I said, that that, um, aspect there that and of course, and in in the vast majority of cases, we are talking about women and girls. So it is still a sort of it's it's not an incorrect or untrue thing to to do or to, or to say. So yeah, just it's useful to to clarify these things. So we've talked quite a lot about what you've done in terms of results and things that you've found out so far. What's what what, what what's the picture looking like? I'll start off with um, elite athletes, mm. and then I'll go into what that looks like in a school setting, right. if that's okay. Yeah, so that'll be. It's really similar, but varied at the same time. Starting off with elite athletes, um, I touched on that actually the menstrual cycle does affect um, elite athletes. um, And also to highlight actually that a lot higher percentage of elite athletes actually use hormonal contraceptives to try and manage their menstrual cycle for reasons of reducing those negative symptoms we've discussed, um, controlling the time of when they've got a bleed. Um, you know, so that's kind of an interesting aspect in itself. So in, in short, this is the, the pill basically can can regulate your periods much more effectively. Is that is that the, the case? The pill is one as one yep. of many. Yep. Um so there's different types of hormonal contraceptives that mm-hmm. you could use. So okay. that might be the pill. In some instances, um it might be um like an implant or an IUD. And these can actually in some not just only regulate the time in, but can actually stop a period completely, which there's been quite a lot in an area of research that I'm kind of exploring as well at the moment with elite athletes and that aspect of using hormonal contraceptives and not having a period. Um, Actually, the menstrual cycle is a great sign of health and having a regular menstrual cycle is a super important sign of health. So actually having that regular cycle consistently um obviously taking hormonal contraceptives can kind of reduce that kind of nice extra sign that almost female athletes have over male athletes um from an energy perspective so that's been quite a a topical conversation at the moment and something that there's there's positives and negatives to both sides really um so the research is kind of growing in that area and really trying to support elite female athletes from an energy deficiency perspective as well. Results from me from a coach education perspective have been, we've been investigating whether um, like providing coach education can actually make a difference, can kind of help with some of these conversations um, and increase that knowledge and awareness. And from where I was 
five years ago to where I am now, having delivered those sessions and evaluated that as an intervention. Um, it's been great to see the difference that that can make just by increasing the confidence. I suppose what we're doing today, you know, understanding different terminology, like what to talk about, actually the symptoms, what what can affect, just those bits of details have had quite a big, from my perspective anyway, change on how things look in sport. Very interesting. And yeah, I'm, <laughs> I'm certainly learning a lot as well. <laughs> as well. But um, that point there about just improving general health and well-being, there's, there's obviously a broader impact to this research. Yeah, hugely. I mean, that really ties in, I suppose, with one of the reasons going more into school yeah. type work. Yeah, tell us about school. Because at elite level, I was almost, would, once we've researched it, we were finding that it was the same thing coming through that, yes, the menstrual cycle was having a negative impact on performance. Um, we also saw that actually elite athletes were having um, a loss of period, loss of menstrual cycle. So therefore, when we were supporting them, it was delivering the same thing over and over again. And as you just mentioned there, not just performance, but actually that can have quite a large impact on a health and wellbeing perspective. You know, we can go down another route of actually how that affects bone health and cardiovascular health. Like there's so many different areas. And it was actually like, how do we try and change that? At, you know, what point can we research and step in so that that changes? And that's when going into schools, um, we were talking to pupils to understand actually, does it affect them? It, it, you know, taking part in physical activity, which the results have quite clearly come back as yes, it does have a, a, a very big impact on, especially um, girls staying physically active. Um, and therefore what we're currently doing is piloting an intervention of um, menstrual education within schools to see actually by providing them with some of the information um, around symptom management, the benefits of physical activity to reduce the severity of symptoms, all those different aspects. Um, hopefully, again, long term, that will also be really beneficial from a health and wellbeing perspective. So think, thinking about the broader context, obviously there, there are issues here about, about girls in sport and young people dropping out of sport. And obviously there's probably all these discussions kind of funnel into your research or your research funnels into these kind of questions, I would imagine. Yeah, definitely. So I suppose that's one of the reasons that also now I've talked around um, elite performance and potentially how that's impacted. But equally, um, the menstrual cycle we know is one of the um, kind of highest barriers for girls taking part in physical activity or actually even causing them to drop out of physical activity. So um, actually... Um, this is where I suppose we're talking more specifically around actually having a period in the time of bleeding. That's typically associated with actually girls not want, you know, struggling to manage that or not feeling comfortable being able to actually manage their period in order to be able to be physically active, which I suppose the, you know, not just the short term effect of that, but long term, um, you know, it can affect kind of habits of like that health and that well-being, you know, the benefits of physical activity are huge. And if there's girls dropping out of sport at a really young age, you know, girls might st start their periods as young as nine. Um, you know, that can then really impact longer term um, behaviours and, um, you know, how how active that they are. So, um, yeah, it's definitely and that links with providing menstrual education of actually how to manage um, periods. So for for girls, how do you manage them whilst you're physically active so that hopefully it allows um, many more to stay within sport, stay active um, and not drop out. Um, swimming is a, a really common sport that we see a big dropout of girls because of the aspect of actually having to to manage that time of bleeding. Um, so, you know, actually by hopefully providing more support in the research we're completing is, is a key aim. I think we've covered it on this show before, but I can speak from a personal experience um, for once on, on 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 this particular episode that um, that you know physical activity is such a boon. It's it, it helps in so many different ways and also has a kind of indirect impact on things like mental health as well. So it's 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 important work in 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 that sense. I think it's exactly things like you know um, physical activity we know can improve mood, but 
you know, if you've got that's one symptom from the menstrual cycle sure. that you're really struggling with mood. Well, yes. actually, physical activity is quite uh, quite e, and it doesn't have to be you know going and running a marathon or you know it might just be going for a walk. It might be doing ten minutes of yoga. Absolutely. Something as small as that can actually really reduce the severity of um, symptoms related to a natural menstrual cycle. Tell us about uh, or tell us more about. Um this actual experience of working with school pupils, what's that been like? Oh, it's been really fascinating. <laughs> I've actually loved it. So I've been going in, I've been doing focus groups, so talking to pupils, asking them about experiences of the menstrual cycle, experiences of their education related to the menstrual cycle in school, um, to try and find out what they'd want. So essentially with with the intervention of a new um, kind of menstrual education programme, really wanted it to be informed by pupils. You know, one of the questions was, are you happy having it delivered at school? Would you prefer to watch a video at home? Um, but it's been really interesting how different, again, obviously going back to that individual experience, some pupils have been so open and happy talking about it and sharing everything, asking all of these different questions, like why do we have stomach cramps? How do I um, manage when I feel really moody? You know, like I really struggle when I'm in an exam to concentrate. What can I do with that? You know, some of those really practical questions. But equally, there's also been individuals that have been really shy and, you know, not as confident to be able to talk openly or know even what to talk about or understand. You know, in some situations, we've almost ditched the focus group and I've ended up talking about actually what is the metro cycle? Um, what does that mean? What can you expect? Um, how much blood might you lose? You know, all of those quite might seem quite simple questions, but are all unknowns that have um, really been been trying to help share some of that information. Yeah, and what is it like being either with small groups, but groups individuals doing that in in schools? I mean, I, I guess stereotypically you might think that teenagers are, are not always the easiest easiest bunch to work with, but obviously you've you've had a really positive experience. Yeah, I've had a really positive experience. And it's actually been really refreshing that I've had some individuals that have actually said it's been really nice to have the opportunity to talk and also had the opportunity to ask the questions. So it has definitely been mixed. Not everyone has been like that. Some have been like, why am I here and why do I need to talk about periods? Um especially slightly older individuals that have okay. almost been like I've had my period now for five years already I know everything even though as we've discussed more and more they've gone oh actually I didn't know that that would help my symptoms but um yeah and then younger girls that maybe haven't started their periods they've equally been a bit unsure because they've not had their own personal experience to draw upon but on the whole it's actually been really different actually to what I thought it would be in terms of the openness of that conversation. How do you select where you go to speak to these pupils? Is it a range of different schools? Is it a range of different kinds of schools as well? Yeah, we've tried to be as much like variation as possible. Um, obviously, when you're doing focus groups, it's never going to be representative of everyone, um, but try to do it in terms of like in all girls school compared to mixed schools, in academies, state schools, um, and in different, you know, different areas as well that may be more rural compared to. So I did one in Hereford, which was like a really rural, small school compared to central London. Yeah. Um, just to try and understand, you know, are there different um, aspects in society that are also influencing that? Um, and so what was socioeconomic differences as well? Yeah. yeah. And what was interesting was it was the same conversation in every school, no matter where I was. Yeah. And that's, I found really fascinating. So there's a universality here actually to, to the experience to an extent. Yeah. No matter. And again, whether that was with year seven mm -hmm. or year 10, it was a very, very similar conversation to the point I was like, wait a minute, am I, am I having the same conversation over again? It was deja vu deja. a little bit. <laughs> so this is the, um, th this is working with the pupils. What about the teachers? Are you working with the teachers to any, to any extent as well? Yeah. So before speaking to pupils, we actually did a, um, a survey with teachers um, to understand what menstrual education is provided. Um, this is all just in UK schools, actually. I probably should have highlighted mm -hmm. To understand, like, do they feel supported in delivering metro education? What are the barriers to put in delivering that? Um, do they actually deliver any metro education to try and kind of gain a bit more insight as to what the current status is like within the UK? That then led on to people um, focus groups. And then alongside that, we've been talking to in 
doing individual interviews with teachers that either deliver mentor education or are peer teachers from two different aspects there, I suppose, of how does it affect them in physical activity, but also understanding more about what is delivered and potentially, again, from their perspective, anything that would make it easier or would be helpful in order to change that. And I suppose their relationship with their pupils is is in some ways trickier and more difficult than, say, yours, when you can come in to speak about something very particular. Their role as teachers is quite holistic, and I would guess that that often is a barrier to talking about very personal stuff or very specific stuff. I don't know, I'm just, I'm speculating. No, one thing that um, a lot of the teachers, so after I've we did the focus groups, I also gave the schools kind of um, some of the feedback on what they'd said and some of like the key points of, um, you know, a, one thing that came out consistently was access to toilets during lessons. So just feeding things like that back to the teachers. Um, but a lot of the teachers were like, actually, the, the pupils have never brought that up. Um, so I suppose, as you said, almost being slightly external, slightly separate from that may have also really helped that conversation. And research like this often then feeds, or it can feed, or has the has the potential to feed into policy and and even law changes or whatever. And you are working, I think, are you not with sort of the Welsh government or UK government? So yeah, tell us about that. So that's been linked more with um, Sport Wales, okay. I suppose, from a yeah. sporting perspective um, on the Welsh government mm-hmm. and their period dignity um, plan. So as part of that consultation process, um, we kind of shared with what we were doing from a Sport Wales perspective. And again, how sport I think can also be a helpful platform to try and address some of the maybe um, kind of lacking of awareness or knowledge but also actually how we can support that and as I've said also help use it to manage some of the symptoms so that's kind of been one of the the pieces of work there and then I suppose the next steps of where we're up to now is once we've piloted the intervention from the mental education again to then go back with the findings of that to say you know if it was successful if it wasn't and the general feedback from that um to then as you said then informing policy so actually what is mental education like as part of the curriculum um and kind of that much wider bigger picture really so do you see this work affecting change in the long term and and if so Ideally, how? I mean, that was obviously something that I'm definitely working towards. Doing the pilot intervention, first of all, is to try and establish if that is the best way to kind of achieve that. Um, But if it is, then again, it's, yeah, working with the kind of curriculum, with policy um, to understand actually what what does that, what needs to change and therefore influencing that change, like informed by research um if and I suppose one of the key aims from the research I've done so far in my kind of experience is actually how can we change that level of awareness and knowledge across everyone so um you know it can also then help with um you know I've talked around symptoms that are manageable but in some situations there are medical conditions um you know endometriosis PCOS um and helping individuals to understand that what they're experiencing might actually not be normal and to go and seek medical support for that um, and just having that understanding that it's not something that they need to suffer with and that there is kind of solutions for that. So there's, I suppose, that educational piece, but also a much bigger picture within that as well of um, kind of individuals that menstruate to feel supported um, and know that they can access that support. I guess on the big picture as well, this this topic is still broadly a bit of a taboo taboo subject. And I suppose you'd like to play a, a role in in changing that. One hundred percent. And I think even just having conversations, you know, like having this conversation today, that's one step forward. And you know, people that have listened again, that's another group of people that start understanding more and also going actually, why questioning? Why is it a taboo? Why you know? Why do we see it as something secretive when? actually it is you know we talk about heart rate quite openly we talk about breathing quite openly we talk about um our appetite and how hungry we are these are all things controlled by hormones and the menstrual cycle is exactly the same as that it's a process controlled by hormones so actually how does it just become part of that normal day-to-day conversation if you can get this slightly buttoned up bloke to talk about it and (laughs) (laughs) openly and learn stuff then you're you're that's that's one, one tiny tiny step 
You mentioned collaboration uh, a moment ago or sort of working with other people, but I know this kind of work involves working with big networks normally. So do you want to say more about you know, the, the groups and the and the organisations even perhaps that you, you work with? Yeah, and they've been really varied actually, although predominantly working in sport um, and having collaborations with like Sport Wales and national governing bodies, it's also included um, like Youth Sport Trust and um, how we can work with them um, in their Girls Active programme to try and encourage um, that kind of, from that aspect of trying to improve participation. Governing bodies have been really varied. Um, huge amount of different governing bodies across Wales, but also UK-wide. Um, but then also universities, so especially the school work that I'm doing. Um, there's definitely, there's a team of us from different universities. So, um Laura's from um, University West of Scotland. Then we've got Georgie from Orico. Jess is from Nottingham Trent. Um, Becky is from Stride Active, which is um, more of a partnership and again, working with schools. So we've got all over, yeah, I'm UK based, but all over working together um, on this that one project. And that's just one example. You know, I've got other colleagues that are based in Australia that I collaborate with. Um, Again, I mentioned obviously the research in Sweden. So it's also really nice how open and supportive actually the kind of academic network is around this area. There's been a real kind of how can we work together to really drive and create change in this rather than all working in little pockets on our own. And and this international element, obviously doing doing collaboration with people overseas has never been easier in, in, in some ways, but it, what form does that work in particular take? You Are you all working on quite similar things and comparing comparing notes and approaches? What, what, yeah, what are you up to? Yeah, it's really varied. Some of it's um, kind of, like you said there, like working on similar things and like comparing and contrasting. Um, is it different in different countries? So actually, is if they got similar um, to what we're finding in Australia, to what we're finding in the UK, but also it's about... Um, you know, especially if I'm thinking more of an elite athlete perspective, um, actually the number of elite athletes that menstruate in the UK is quite a small number. If And it's the same in a lot of different countries. Obviously, it is a small population to try and understand this in. So by collaborating and working together, we're actually able to, you know, have a bigger group that we can then understand what's going on in more detail by kind of joining together. Can I ask a bit more about you and your background and how you came into this work? Yeah, most definitely. Um, so I actually did sports science at Swansea University um, and I'd always had an interest in that. Just I really enjoyed sport myself. Um, I was always really active um, and then stayed at Swansea to do a master's degree, which really focused on elite performance um, and like preparation um, for competition that actually led me into working as a sports scientist so I actually went and worked as a physiologist um, within swimming um, which I loved for two years worked with a team up into the Commonwealth Games supported them all the way through which was really great fun um, but also identified that I really liked project-based work um, so although I was doing day-to-day -day support there was also like a lot of projects, a lot of unanswered questions in performance that I was just like, I want to go and find all this out. Um, so went back to do a PhD. Um, again, I've done all of my academic um, studies at Swansea University. I keep coming back. Um, so I did my PhD, but that focused quite a lot around hormonal responses um, in across males and females, um, looking at testosterone, cortisol responses um, from an elite performance perspective. And through that, I started kind of exploring more around actually how does the menstrual cycle fit into these kind of hormonal responses that we're talking about. A lot of research was in males in sports science. Um, when I was trying to kind of write up my PhD, I was just I had this group of female athletes. That I was just like, I don't really know how this fits. There's kind of not the research to compare it to. Um, and that really started, I suppose, my interest around hormonal responses, um, performance in sport, um, which led me more into kind of that kind of menstrual cycle, female athlete perspective, but also my own experience. Like I'm quite happy to to share my own experiences that, you know, I did compete um, as a swimmer. 
I now do a lot of climbing. And again, my menstrual cycle, how was that? You know, I was fine. I was like, why am I scared all of a sudden? Like, this is really weird. I was fine doing that last week. And now I feel more scared or I'm more worried about hurting myself or I've just not got the motivation to go and do that. Um, so also from my own experience, I kind of started mapping what was going on um, and kind of if, feel really fortunate to to be able to bring the two things together. I was going to say, you know, a lot of people, not not in all cases, but a lot of people have a quite personal reason for going into the line of work they do. I was going to ask if you were sporty and yeah, I can imagine that particularly swimming probably poses some challenges for 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 women in that way. 100% and that's, I suppose, I was maybe quite fortunate that I enjoyed swimming so much that I was just like, when I started my period, I was like, that's not going to let me stop me. I'm going to find a way to manage that. But also I've become, especially doing the work with pupils, become more and more aware that actually not everyone either has that kind of, I suppose, mindset to do that or the other aspect is the ability to do that. So, you know, being able to afford to buy tampons or a menstrual cup or period swimwear might not always be an option. So again, trying to, that's a, I suppose, a slightly different area around period poverty, but actually I think through conversations and opening up the, the kind of experiences that people have will also be inf- really informative and hopefully create that change. Yeah. In the, in the medium and long term, where do you see all of this going or where do you hope all of this is going? That That's a big question. I think um, medium term is, um, you know, hopefully trying to really inform and better support female athletes. Um, long term is actually speaking to the conversation we had around informing policy. Yeah. Actually, how can we change that from an educational perspective so that, you know, we're not sat here, you're you might not be sat here learning today. This would just be a normal conversation. Um, and I suppose that would be one of the really long-term aims yeah. um, starting off in the UK. But then again, obviously, we've got the collaborations more widely. How can we change that? And it's, again, a very different conversation when we compare high-income countries to low-income countries. Um, but the fact that we've not even got this right yet, um, I think, is but something that doesn't mean to say it can't be applied to everyone by doing some some kind of quite hopefully simple basic um conversations and awareness there will be people probably listening to this this conversation that we're we're having and obviously they they, they are very likely to be interested in it but they might be feel, feel particularly drawn to what you say about your work being quite project based for example and maybe not what your typical academic does perhaps if they are thinking in that way, what advice would you give people in terms of getting into your line of work, perhaps young people who are thinking about their university choices, for example? Definitely. I think one of the things is um, there are there are opportunities to get involved um, with lots of different things, whether that's through charities or through research or through, um, you know, even as a potentially a student getting being active in your school or being active in your university. There's more and more kind of information out there as to how you can start promoting conversations or you know supporting peers um for me that's one kind of hopefully quite straightforward and resource not not require much resource to actually be able to achieve that so you know you know whether that's setting up like a group in your school or in your university to think about actually how can you better support individuals who menstruate um whether that's making sure there is access to menstrual project products or having somewhere that people can go and talk to and have a space where you know they can openly go and ask questions or point in the direction of different um information that could be helpful i think things like that are what I'd recommend to start off with. Um, and then to to actually be confident and reach out to people that are doing research because most of the time in this area, it's so it's not new, but it, there's so much to do that actually I'm, I definitely know for myself that if anyone's interested in doing it, I'm always like welcoming to have people on board to help investigate and talk and find more things out. So um, yeah, 
be get confident, in, get, in touch. get in touch. Yeah, get in touch if you're interested. Yeah. Natalie, has been fascinating. Thank you. If you want to find out more about Natalie's research, you can visit her website, optimalperiod.com, or follow her on Instagram at optimal.period. To find out more about this podcast and Swansea University's research, visit swansea.ac.uk forward slash research. That's all from us today. Thanks for listening. And thank you once again to my guest, Dr. Natalie Brown. If you've enjoyed this episode, please follow us. I'm Sam Blaxland, and that was Exploring Global Problems from Swansea University.